This video is sponsored by Wren. Discover what your carbon footprint is and how you can offset it with Wren's environmental explanations. Wren is a website focused on the effects of climate change and how we can all individually combat it. So you can head over to the website, go through a quick free questionnaire about what your consumption habits are. It's questions like how often do you shop online? How many times per week do you eat red meat? It takes about five minutes. And when you're done, they've got lots of handy information and graphs that put your carbon footprint into context. But Wren doesn't just stop there. They're constantly scouring the globe for reforestation efforts and carbon capture projects that they want to help. And if you're so inclined, you can help too. After you've determined your carbon footprint, you can choose to donate a monthly sum that will offset your own footprint by helping to fund some of these environmental projects. For instance, Wren recently partnered with a California-based biochar project that removes flammable biomass from high-risk fire areas and pyrolyzes it. They mix the resulting biochar with compost and sell it to local farmers, helping to reduce the risk of wildfires and also reduce climate change. Win-win! And once you've made a financial commitment, you can begin receiving a monthly update centered around rainforest protection, tree planting initiatives, and carbon capture projects. Wren knows it's going to take a lot of work to address climate change, but it's easier when we all contribute just a little bit. If that sounds like something you'd be interested in checking out, please do head to ren.co or use my link in the description box below. And as a special partnership between Ren and my channel, they're going to plant 10 extra trees for each of the first 100 people who sign up using the link below. Very nice. And now today's video. When a man loses his testicles, it causes a variety of medical issues, and thus hormone replacement therapy is common when possible. In contrast, most of us bring our male pets to the vet to have their uh, balls removed, and after the pain of the surgery is gone, they seem to be just fine. So what are the different effects here in humans versus animals, and why is the latter not seen as a big deal, while the former is the stuff of nightmares for almost every male watching this? To illustrate the effects on human males, we'll start by taking a look at a famous but now extinct career, the castrati singers of the 17th to the 19th century, who give us perhaps the best look at what happens when human males are castrated at a young age, similar to pets. Until the 19th century, women were not allowed to join a choir performing in a church. To make up for the loss of higher voices this rule brought in, neither falsetto singers or young boys were employed as soprano and alto voices. Both of these methods have distinct disadvantages. Falsetto is a Way one can learn to sing, which enables the singer to extend their notes beyond their normal vocal range via producing vibrations of the ligamentous edges of the vocal cords. The problem is that the singer is much more limited in the dynamic variation quality that he or she would be able to use in their normal register. Also, the sound is slightly different due to a lack of overtones. It has a breathy, flute-like sound. Thus, as an alternate, the prevailing strategy was to fill the higher voices with young boys. On this note, from the 6th century on, the Vatican employed falsetto singers from Spain to sing the higher vocal parts. But in 1562, the first Spanish castrato singer joined their ranks. In 1599, the first two Italian castrati singers were also hired. Where they came from is not totally clear, but there must have been a tradition to perform castrations in Italy even before that, because just castration won't make a great singer. Usually boys had up to 10 years of musical training after castration, before they became the world-famous singers that castrati often were. But why is castration influencing the voice? and why was it done to young boys? When the testicles are removed or their functions are otherwise decapitated, the body loses its main production center for the male sex hormone testosterone, and their bodies experience the effects of that loss in various ways. The effects vary depending on when the lack of testosterone starts, but the main question is before or after puberty. In a male body, testosterone plays a key factor during embryogenesis. It basically turns you male in your mother's womb, and then it sends you into puberty and is responsible for the development of the secondary male characteristics. So if a boy is castrated between the ages of 7 and 9, some sources even give ages as late as 12, they never hit puberty, so their bodies keep a boyish or even female look with no body or facial hair. Beyond this, they also grew to a higher body height than average, as the sex hormones also play a key role in stopping your growth. They also tend to put on weight more easily and are more susceptible to osteoporosis. Furthermore, testosterone deficiency contributes to the onset or worsening of various diseases, like cardiovascular disease, and it's strongly associated with diabetes and more aggressive variants of cancer. And, of course, due to the surgery done to them, the castrati singers were sterile. Incidentally, this factor also led to some unfair treatment by the Catholic Church. 
Pope Sixtus V was asked if castrati singers were capable of marriage. Until then, lawyers and theologists considered a man able to marry if he was capable of performing penetrative sex with his penis, so he needed to be able to maintain an erection, and some also considered the ability to ejaculate to be needed. Pope Sixtus V had a different opinion. He declared that regardless of their ability to get a hard-on and shoot anything out of their penis, castrati weren't capable of marrying, and he even decreed that all such existing marriages had to be annulled. To get around this, some castrati singers switched to using Protestant priests up north in Germany. On this note, there are a lot of myths of the sexual prowess of the castrati singers. How true these myths are is difficult to ascertain. Of course, it would be quite advantageous for a woman who didn't want the stigma of a pregnancy to start an affair with one of these singers, who were then the equivalent of our modern celebrity superstars. As you might have guessed from this, there are indications that at least some of the castrati had a sex drive, while others didn't. It seems that much depended on the timing of their surgery. Boys castrated before the age of 10 often grew up with feminine features and a complete lack of sex drive. Those a little further along were more of a mixed bag. But let's come back to what is really important here. The voice. One of the effects of puberty in males is the deepening of the voice. This happens by the lengthening of the vocal cords. The vocal cords of adult men are 67% longer than the vocal cords of prepubescent boys. As a comparison, a woman's vocal cord only increases 24% during puberty. So, if you have a castrati singer, you basically have the vocal cord of a child, but behind that, the lung capacity and the fully grown resonating chamber of a man, which leads to the very unique and highly sought after voice of the castrato. We already touched upon castrati singers singing in church choirs, but they also dominated the opera houses, singing both male and female roles for more than 200 years. There, they inspired a lot of famous composers like George Friedrich Handel, Domenico Scarlatti, Antonio Vivaldi, Christopher. Willibald Gluck, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, and many more to write their famous operas. Which leads to some interesting problems nowadays. If you want to perform one of these Baroque operas where the male parts were written for castrati singers, how do you staff that today? Especially as it was even quite common that the male lead voice was sung at a higher register than the female lead. In more recent times, it's quite common just to transpose the male voice into a tenor register, but of course that doesn't give you the real intended sound that the composer wanted. So directors often choose to either cast a falsetto singer into that role, or staff it with a woman who won't necessarily give quite the same sound, but at least it's closer. So this little excursion into the history of the castrati singers might have given you a good impression of what's the difference between the castration of a man and your pet. There's none. In both cases, the male individuum will experience the effects of testosterone deficiency. The only difference is that these effects are nowadays mostly unwanted in humans, but desired in pets. Today, human men mostly get castrated for medical reasons, if they have a tumor in their testicles or their prostate, for example. With this, hormone replacement therapy is helpful if they suffer from the effects of the low testosterone levels. Unfortunately, that is sometimes not possible, especially in advanced prostate cancer, as testosterone is, in this condition, often a factor that helps the tumor grow. For men undergoing these treatments and suffering from symptoms like gynecomastia, that's an increase in the size of the male breast tissue, erectile dysfunction, reduced libido, which might challenge a patient's self-identity, it might be important to know that sources taken from history, may it be Byzantium, Roman antiquity, early Islamic societies, the Ottoman Empire, Chinese dynasties, or the previously discussed castrati period, the castrated men consistently held powerful social positions, often with great political influence. Furthermore, they were often recognized for their loyalty, managerial style, wisdom, and pedagogical skills. Also, in some cultures, they were considered the object of sexual desire for males, females, or both, and not consistently asexual and celibate, as many think today. All right, so let's talk about animals. The story's a little different there. Pets are usually castrated for a reason, the most common being birth control. But it also often changes the social behavior of these animals. It is known that by 4500 BCE, humans were castrating cattle and sheep to change their behavior and make them more manageable. On this note, it's argued that the use of an ox for plowing a field, which was a contributing factor for modern civilization forming, was only possible due to more docile, castrated oxen. The first known human castration followed not long after that. There are signs that the first men purposefully castrated began around 4000 BCE in a rook. While in Europe it was mainly done to preserve the unbroken male voice into adult life, in the far Middle East, castration was often done to obtain eunuchs as guardians of the harems. 
Back to the animals. One study looking into the effects of castration on dogs, which were older than two years and showed at least one type of problematic behavior, found that castration was most effective in altering objectionable urine marking, mounting, and roaming behaviors. In these behaviors, a significant improvement was shown in more than half of the dogs. For other types of aggressive behavior, castration may be effective in some dogs, but less than a third of the dogs showed a marked improvement. Beyond behavior, one very important factor for castration in animals we haven't touched upon yet is that due to the sex hormone testosterone, the meat starts to change in its taste and smell when the animal hits puberty. So to preserve a high meat quality, you have two options. Either slaughter the animal before it hits puberty, or cut their balls off. But in the end, there really isn't that much of a difference between the effects of castrating a human versus an animal. It's just the effects of testosterone deficiency are mainly unwanted in human males, so hormone therapy is often advisable, if possible, to make up for the effects here. Whereas in animals, the side effects are mostly desirable, so nothing much is done after the balls are lopped off, other than maybe an initial application of the cone of shame to the animal. And now for some bonus facts. Not only singers used to be castrated, but also some priests. In some of the earliest records of human religion, undergoing a ritual of castration was seen as an act of devotion. Some even argue that circumcision is only a modified, less invasive, and bloody ritual of castration, as it has many similar aims in human religions. Martin Luther also had a quite interesting take on clerical celibacy. He compared it to the self-castration of the priests of Sybil. Castration was, and is in some countries to this day, also used as a punishment mostly if men don't adhere to what is thought of as normal sexuality at that place and at that time. One famous example of this is British mathematician, code breaker, and the father of modern computing, Alan Turing. His work was essential in breaking the code of the Enigma, the machine that the Germans used to encrypt their messages during World War II. It's estimated that because of his work, the duration of the war was shortened by two years and thus saved millions of lives. No good deed goes unpunished, and when it became known that he was gay, he was convicted and given the choice between prison or to undergo chemical castration. He chose the latter, but due to side effects of the treatment, Turing became depressed and committed suicide two years later, shortly before his 42nd birthday. A little late, but we guess better than never. On Christmas Eve 2013, Queen Elizabeth II issued a royal pardon for Alan Turing. Further in 2017, Turing's law came into effect, which pardons the thousands of gay and bisexual men convicted for their sexual acts. So I really hope you found today's video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Do not forget to subscribe, and thank you for watching.